I don't know. It's the power in the top. It's a new barrel and everything. Is the heart one okay? Yeah. Well, would you not switch them around and let a man have a pint of stout? No. What about the heart drinkers? The heart drinkers. Ah, your man's coming to do it in the morning. Have a bottle. I'm having a bottle. I'm not happy about it in the mind, right? But like. Go on out of that. What the hell? Good for the worms. <laughs> I'd say you've right couple worms yourself. That's some wind, isn't it? It is. It must have been against you, was it? It was. It was against me till I came around enough. It was a bit of shelter then. That's a funny one. It's coming from the north. Uh, it's mild enough, though. Ah, it's balmy enough. It's balmy. Where are you in character today? I wasn't, no. Had the sisters over, doing their rounds, checking up on me. Checking their investments. Yeah, of course they don't have a fucking clue what they're looking for, don't you know? They're just vaguely, you know? Keeping the pressure on you. <sighs> this is it. At me to sell the top field. You don't use it much. No, I don't. Too much trouble driving a hurry. But I know they're looking at it. All they see is new cars for the hubbies. You're not just trying to spite them, huh? Get them vexed. Not at all. It's just... It's a grand spot up there. I don't know. I just... Mm. They over the whole day. Ah, they came around too. They'd gone for lunch in the arms, got their story straight, and they were gone at all about half four. They've no attachment to the place, no? No, they don't. They look around and it's, ah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's gas. <laughs> Where are you carrying yourself? I was. Flew in about 11, threw on a fast bet. Jimmy was there, we went for a quick one in the pot. How is he in the month? Ah, Jimmy, be in tonight. He put me on to a nice one. We got her at 11 to 4. You're learning to listen, huh? Ah, fuck that, sure. I know, but I've been having the worst one of shit you wouldn't believe. I was that desperate, I'd listen to anybody. Go on out of that. No, no. No, no. Fair rules, I'll say it. He got us a right one, and it's good you know, break a streak like that. You're a user. Ah, uh, there's worse. Yeah, there might be. <laughs> but um, he was telling me, did you know about Maura Nealon's house? No. Well, Jim says he met Finbar Mac down in the spar, finally either sold or rented the thing after how many years it sat there? Uh, four or five in, anyway. Mm. Jim says, five this month. And Finbar's going bananas with the great fella that he is, uh, patting himself on the back, though, and talking about the new resident, who, he says, is a fine girl, single, down from Dublin and all this. <laughs> and Finbar's nearly leaving the wife just to have a chance with this one. <laughs> Only mess in life. But he's bringing her in here tonight, the nearest place to old Amara's. Bringing her in for a drink, introduce her to the mages. Ah, the dirty bastard. I don't want him using it in here for that sort of carry on. A married man like him. Ah, he's only old shit. <laughs> he wouldn't have the nerve. Sure, how far did he get anyway? The fucking head on. <laughs> he's only having a little thrill, bringing her around. And I'll tell you what it is as well. He's coming in here with her, and he's the one. He's the one that's with her in whatever fucking sense we're talking about. He's bringing her in. And there's you and me and the Jimmy fella, the muggins, the single fellas. And he's the married fella. And he's going, well, look at this. There's obviously something the fuck wrong with this. Yours are single and you couldn't get a woman near this place. And look at me. I'm married. I'm hitched. I'm over and done with. And I'm having to beat them off. Uh, it's some cunts always go about their business. It's intrusive. It's bad manners. Ah, uh, do but I'll carry on, you know. Mm. Let her come in herself. Yes, that would be better. That would make more sense for fuck's sake. Leave her be. Don't know if I'll stay, actually. Mm? Go on. Don't want to leave Jimmy in the lurch, you know. Trying to hold his own in the thin bar Mac world of big business. Uh. Jimmy's talking all that fucking crack with Finbar. Mm -hmm. That's the thing, though. The Jimmy fella's got more going on up here than popular opinion would give him credit for. Sure, don't we know too well, for God's sakes? I know. We know only too well. Are we all right? Uh, yeah. Close enough. Cheers. Good luck. I know I do be at you. I'll keep at you, though. About what? Ah, oh, don't be messing, come on. Yeah. yeah. A young
young fella like you and this place a right going concern. Ah, the odd time, you know? The odd time I think about it. You should, though. Well, then so should you. Would you go on, an old fella like me? Would you listen to him? Sure. What would I want, giving up my freedom? Well, then, Misa. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe there's something to be said for the old independent. Ah, there is. <laughs> a lot to be said for. Mm. Cheers. Good luck. Oh, yes, Brandon, the luck is changing. I got the Jimmy fella on to a nice one today. That fella wants to listen to me a bit more often, I'll tell you. Oh, oh <laughs> I'm going to have to start charging you for tips, am I? James, what do you have? I'll teach you some manners. Teach him some manners, Brendan. Small one, please, Jack. Small one? Sure. It'd take more than money to put manners on me, huh, Brendan? I'd take a bomb on you. Now you said it. Bomb is right. That wind's still up, Jim. Oh, yeah, but it's warmer now. We were just saying. For northerly. No, it's changed. It's from the west now. Is it? Yeah, it's a westerly. Must have shifted. Mm, thanking you. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> are we right? Now we are. Sure, it's hard enough to come by without giving it away. This is it. Uh, oh, are you doing anything tomorrow? What time? I have to get out to Connor Bowl. His tractor's packed up, and I have Father Donald's jalopy in since Tuesday. Said I'd change the oil. Haven't done it yet. Would you ever come in and do it so I could get over to Bowen's? It'd have to be early. I'm taking the mother out to Sligo. Well, whatever. Is that all right? Oh, it should be. Um, no. Uh, pint? Not for the moment. You go on. Uh, pint, please, Brendan. Are you on the bottles? Mm, medicinal. Huh? I'm a tax spot. Ah, oh, Jesus, I was wondering what your fucking man be doing down there now. <laughs> he would be the sort of fella to go on a figure and only be drinking the bottles from now on. He would. You would. Be you to a fucking tea, eh? <laughs> How's the mammy today? Uh, you know. I have to get down and see her. I keep saying it. Uh, whenever, whenever you want. Do you think you'll do anything? About what? About up there on your own and all that. Oh, well, you know, I, I was talking to uh, Finbar Mac. Where would I go? You know, uh, I'm lucky to get 20000 for the place. And where would you be going with that, you know? With the anchor. For the whole thing. Ah, uh, you're grand with a few little jobs around here. Uh, You'll be cozy enough. You know, Jack was telling me about Finbar and the, the new app. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I was telling him earlier. I was telling him. No, I, I've seen her since. Oh, yeah? Yeah, they were in Finbar's car, driving up the head. Fucking hell. Like a courting couple or something. <laughs> He's showing her the area. Jesus, <laughs> the area. He's a terrible fucking thick. What the fuck <laughs> is he doing in the hall? Well, you know, uh, this would be the only place that's near to her. She can... Find her own way, surely, Jim. Come on. Well, if it's a courtesy, which is one thing, or a business uh, act, or whatever, we're gonna have to say, well, okay. But if it's all messy and I'm just stuck behind this fucking thing, you wish you'd stop acting a mess. Well, I have to respect. Well, whatever. this is it. We're here now. Well, it's probably not really anything. What age uh, would she be about, Jim? Well, I only saw her for a sec through the car. I'd say she was 30s. Very nice looking. Dublin woman. Dublin? She's known in the area, no? No, she's coming down. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Cheers. Good luck, boys. <laughs> Good luck. Another week or two now, you'll be seeing the first of the Germans. Yeah. Stretching the evening, yeah. You still wouldn't think about clearing one of the fields for a few caravans. Huh? The top field. Ah, there wouldn't be a lot of shelter up there, Jack. There'd be a wind up there that'd cut you. Ah, uh, you know what you could do? The herd would be grand up there, and you could, uh, you know, down here. Sure, they do be around. Oh, you know yourself. They do. <laughs> You're not chasing the extra revenue. Or the work. <laughs> they do be right around enough. I'll leave the campsites to Finbar, eh? He'll sort them out. Nah. Finbar's in real need of a few shekels. Oh, he's in dire need of a few bob, the poor fella. That's right. That's right. Mm. Sure, if you had all the families out there on their holiers and all the kids and all, you'd feel the evenings turning when they'd be leaving. And whatever about how quiet it is now, it'd be fucking shocking quiet then, you know? Mm. Uh, uh, do you want a, a, a small one, Jack? Go on. Uh, two 
Small ones, please, Brendan. Small fellas, are you having one yourself? I'm uh, debating whether to have one. Ah, oh, have one and don't be acting a mess. Uh, go on. Good man. A few shekels, huh? <laughs> Keep the chill out. This is it. Cheers. Good luck, men. Good luck. Now. Ooh. Do you hear a car? No. No, that's Finbar's car. He's parked. I didn't see the lights. Well, he came around the nook. Oh, yeah, sure. Half the town used to nearly live in here. There we are now. <laughs> that's it now. Men, this is Valerie. She just moved into Mara Nilin's old house. Hello, how are you? Hello. Ha! This is Jack Mullen. Uh, he's a little garage up around the knock. Now? And this is Jim Curran. Does a bit of work with Jack. Pleased to meet you. Oh, pleased to meet you. And this is Brendan. Brendan Byrne. Hello. How are you? Uh, yeah, this is his barn, all the land I showed you all back down the hill. That's all his farm. Right, it's all lovely around here. Oh yeah, it's a grand spot all along for going on walks and all uh, all down the cliffs. So. It's lovely all around here. What do you have? No, Finbar, I'll get this one. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> uh, I'll have a pint then. What says you if it's going, huh? Uh, harp, please, Brendan. Jack. Finbar. What would you like, Valerie? Um, uh, could I have a... Well, do you have a, a glass of white wine? Uh, yeah. I'm just gonna run in the house. Oh, no, don't put yourself through the trouble. No, no, it's no trouble. I have a bottle. <sighs> he probably has a bottle of the old vino from Feck and Christmas, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's not too often the wine does be flowing in here. I'm all embarrassed now. Ah, oh, don't be silly. Shut up there now. Don't mind us. Don't mind these country fellas. <laughs> hey, you're not long out of it yourself, says the man. Oh, don't, they're only totally jealous, Valerie, because I went to town to seek my fortune, and they all stayed out here on the bog, picking their holes. Jane, now, you didn't have very far to seek. Just a quick look in Big Finbar's will, I think, is more likely. Ah, <laughs> Big Finbar's will. That shrewd investment boy. It's an eye for the gap, huh? Yeah, he probably fleeced you on Mar Neelan's house, did he? I have to say, I don't think so. Ah, good girl. But it's all very reasonable around here, isn't it? It is, yeah, you know. Is there much doing up on it? Hardly any. One or two floorboards, the paint. Well, there's your man if you're looking for a good pair of hands. Is that right? Yeah, I, I, uh, I know that place. I'll have a look if you like. Don't be charging her through the nose now. Oh, <laughs> no. You wouldn't be giving her a neighborly rate now is the thing, huh? Oh, yeah. Would you listen to him? Neighborly rate. Wasn't by giving neighborly rate you bought half the fucking town. <laughs> half the town? I bought the whole town, huh? Gap, you see? I for your gap. <laughs> yeah, how long has that been in there lying in some drawer, huh? Uh, it was a present or some uh, 1990, huh? Yeah? Vintage, yeah? <laughs> I hope it's all right. That's grand. Uh, I wonder the difference. Uh, it's probably all right. Would you give the woman the feckin' thing the tongue's hanging out of her? <laughs> Thanks, Brendan. That's gorgeous. <sighs> I'm not joking. That's lovely. Mm. I'm going to put this in the fridge for you, Valerie. What would anyone like? Jim, a uh, uh, small one, please, Finbar. Jack, small one, pint. Bottles, is it? You want the bottles? No, the tap is fucking... Uh, oh, typical. Now, uh, I'll have a small one. Go. Yeah, good man. Valerie. Oh, I'm okay for the moment, thanks. You sure? Tuck that up. I'm fine, honestly. You sure now? I'm fine, really. Fair enough. We won't push it. Give us three small ones, Brendan. Good man. Here, you have one. I'm debating whether to have one. No, oh, he'll have one. Go on, Brennan. Who knows when the hell you'll see another drink off the fin bar, fella, huh? Come on, quick. He's all annoyed you're having one. Uh, would you listen to him? That fella peel a banana in his pocket. Oh, <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> First time I've been in here for ages, bringing nice company in and everything, getting this. Oh, you have to watch the Jimmy fella, huh? There's more going on up there than he lets on. Is that what it is, huh? And look at this. Me buying the drinks like a feckin' Egypt, huh? Ah, oh, it's not right. What you think, Valerie? Oh, it's terrible. Ah, oh, it's desperate. Ah, there you go, Brendan. Wouldn't say you see too many 20s in here, huh? With the boys, it wouldn't be too awkward, then I'd say. Ha! <laughs> cheers, boys. Check that cheers. Mm, good luck. Good luck now. Cheers. How did you put up with that fella showing you around? Ah, uh, he was a bit quieter today. Well, you're seeing the real him now, and I bet you prefer the other one. 
We've never seen it. The quiet Finbar. This one comes out at night, you see. Well, I was getting the history of the place and everything today. The history of the place. You were probably making it all up on the spot. Oh, yeah, I was, yeah. Uh, that's why all them photographs are fake. I had them done years ago just to pull battery tonight. <laughs> all right, that's all around here, is it? That's the weir. Uh, when was that taken, Brendan? Uh, 1951. 1951, huh? The weir, the river, the weir end is to regulate the water for generating power in the area and for Carrick as well. Uh, that's your dad there, huh? Yeah, I think your dad's in too. Oh, ha, he is there. Look at this. That's Big Finn Bar there. And that's Brendan's father, Paddy Byrne. Big thing right here, Brendan, eh? Oh, yeah. yeah. You look like your father. You don't. <laughs> ah, he's like his mother. He's like the Mangans. <laughs> now, who would you say that is there in the shorts? Is it you? Oh, would you go on? It's a big fucking head on that, Joe. Excuse the language. That's Jack. Oh, my God. How old were you there, Jack? Um, uh, I was about seven. I wouldn't have guessed it was you. Oh, you must be joking. You'd spot that big modern head anywhere. The photographer nearly had to ask him to go home. There wasn't going to be room in the picture. Isn't that right, Jack? <laughs> That's right. And your dad nearly climbing into the camera there. Ah, he was the pillar of the community, Valerie. No one had anything against him except pillars like your man there, huh? That's right, Finbar. And I'm just going in here to do something up against the pillar of the community. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, he's a desperate fella, that one, huh? Where was this taken? Uh, that's the view of Carrick from our top field up there. It's an amazing view. Oh, probably one of the best views all around here, wouldn't it be? Oh, yeah, I'd say so. Oh, yeah, it would be. You get all the Germans trekking up here in the summer, huh? Up from the campsite. Right. Oh, they do come up. This would be the scenic part of all around here, you know? Uh, there's what? There's stories up there. Uh, the fairies be up there in that field. Isn't there a fort up there? There's a kind of one. Very cool. Ha! The Germans do love all this. Well, there's a ring of trees, you know. Uh, what's the story about the, the fairy road that, that, who used to tell it? Oh, Jack will tell you all them stories. Oh, yeah. There's all this around here, Valerie. The area's steeped in old folklore and that, you know? Oh, Jack will know what the, what the, uh, Jim, you would know if you. Oh, no. Jack could tell you much better than me. Yeah. And that's the Abbey now. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, you'll see more of it there. Now, what was there, Brendan? When was that? Oh, back in the 15-something. Synod of Bishops all came and met there for like, Oh, uh, the town land around here used to be very important about a few hundred years ago, Valerie. This would have been like the capital of the county, it would have been. Right? Uh, it's a very interesting place, huh? Hey, Jack, we're just telling Valerie about the, the... What's the story with the fairy road? The fairy road? I go into the toilet for two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't leave you alone for two minutes. <laughs> I was just telling her about the fort and everything. What was the story with the fairy room? Where was it? Are you really interested? All the fairies. Oh, it's, it's a bit of fun. Tell her, where was it? You're going to regret me saying this now, because you know whose house it was. Whose? It was Maura Neelan's house. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> You see, that's as much cop as you have. I fucking forgot it was Mora. <laughs> These are only old stories, Valerie. No, I'd like to hear it. It's only an old cop. You're not going to be scaring the woman. Ah, oh, it's not scary. I'm interested in it. Ah, oh, you hear all old shit all around here. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> this is a good little story. It's only short. It's just... Mora Neelan <laughs> used to come in here in the evening, sit over here at the fire. How old was she, Jim, when she died? Oh, gee, she must be nearly 90. Mm. But she was a grand, you know, sprightly kind of a woman till the end and had all her, uh, she was on the ball, like, you know. And she swore that this happened when she was only a girl. She lived in that house her whole life. And she had older brothers and sisters. She was the youngest. And her mother... Uh, a bridey? Bridey. She was a well-known woman in the area. A widow woman. She was a bit of a character. A bit of a practical joker. <laughs> and Mara would say that when she was young, uh, she was, bridey was, always doing things on the older kids. Uh, hiding their clothes <laughs> and all this and and she'd tell them old fibs about what a, a certain prospective boyfriend or girlfriend had said about them out on the road, or this about coming courting or that. 
and she was always shouting from upstairs to this kid. There's someone at the door. <laughs> she was always saying, there's someone at the back door. <laughs> there's someone coming up the path. <laughs> and there'd never be anyone there. And people got used to her that she liked her job. And Mara used to say that one Saturday evening, back in about 1910 or 1911, the older ones were getting ready to go out for a dance or whatever was happening. And the mother, Bridie, came down the stairs and said, did no one get to the door? <laughs> and they were all, oh, here we go, you know. But Bridie came down and opened the door. And there was nobody there. And she didn't say anything. And she wasn't making a big thing about it, you know. And Mara said she was only young but she knew there was something wrong. She wasn't cracking the jokes. And later, when the others were all out, it was just her and her mother sitting at the fire. And her mother was very quiet. Normally, she'd send Mara up to bed early enough, like. But Mara said she remembered this night because her mother didn't send her up. She wanted someone with her, you see. And in those days, Valerie, as you know, there was no electricity out here. And there's no dark like a winter night in the country. And there was a wind like this one tonight, howling and whistling in off the sea. You hear it under the door, and it's like someone singing, singing <laughs> in under the door at you. It was this type of night now. Am I setting the scene for you? <laughs> <laughs> then bar's a little bit edgy there. You want to finish that small one? I hey, think. don't mind my small one. You're making very heavy weather of this yarn, Jack. Ah, <laughs> you have to enjoy it now. You have to relish the details of something like this, huh? <laughs> so there they were, just sitting there. And Bridie was staring into the fire, a bit quiet, and smiling now and again at Mara. But Mara said she could see a bit of wet in her eye. And then, there was a soft knocking at the door. Someone at the front door. And Bridie never moved. And Mara said, will I get the door, Mandy? And Bridie said, oh, no, sure. It's only someone playing a joke on us. Don't mind them. So they sat there. And there was no more knocking for a while. And in those days, there was no kitchen. Where the extension is, Valerie, that was the back door, and only a little latch on it, you know. And that's where the next knocking was. Very soft, Morris said, and very low down the door. Not like where you'd expect a grown man or a woman to be knocking up here, you know. And again, Bridie was saying, oh, no, it's only someone having a joke. They'll go away. <laughs> and then he was at the window. <laughs> Mara couldn't see anything out in the night, and her mother wouldn't let her go over. And then it stopped. But when it was lit and the fire went down, Bridie wouldn't get up to get more turf for the fire because it was out in the shed. So they just sat there until the others came back well after midnight. What was it? Well, Mara said her mother never told the others, and then one day, when it was only the two of them there, a priest came and blessed the doors and the windows, and there was no more knock in them. And it was only years later that Mara heard from one of the older people in the area that the house had been built on what you'd call a fairy roll. Like it wasn't a roll, but it was like... It was like a, a roll of things. Right, like from the fort up in Brendan's top field there. Then the old well, and the abbey further down, and into the cove where the little pebbly beach is there. And the legend would be that the fairies would come down that way to bathe, you see. 
and Mara Neelan's house was built on what you'd call that road. And they wanted to come through. Well, that'd be the idea. But Mara never heard the knocking again, except on one time in the 50s when the weir was going up. There was a bit of knocking then, she said, and fierce load of dead birds all in the hedge and this. But that's it. That's the story. You're not bothered by that, are you, Valerie? Because it's only old cod, you know. You hear all these stories up and down the country. Well, I think there's probably something in them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do. Ah, uh, there, there might be all right. But it doesn't hurt. Bit of an old story like this. But I'll tell you what. It'd give you a thirst like you know. <laughs> what do you have? Valerie, chop that. Um, Go on. Ah, she will, Brendan. This glass is fine. Oh, country ways, good girl. Finbar, pint. Pint? Uh, why not, says you, huh? Jip. Uh, yeah. Two pints and one of these, please. Brendan. <laughs> Two pints? Yep. Oh, yeah. Are you having one yourself? I'm debating. Who's winning? Uh, it's a draw. I'll have a glass. Ah, good man. Have two, huh? <laughs> Talking of the fairy roll. Didn't you have a little run-in with the fairies, or who was it, that time before you went? Ah, oh, now, Jesus. Because you were very brave that time, weren't you? Oh, Jack, for fuck's sake. Come on, you were brave that time. You're a bollocks. Well, you, you know, talking of the fairies now, you know. Oh, it wasn't the fairies. It was the Walsh young one having us all on. It was only a cod, sure. Oh, she's in America now. Neve Walsh. Uh, it was Neve that time, yeah? Oh, she was a header looking for attention. What happened? This was the brave fella. Ah, uh, stop. It was nothing. This was a family lived up beside Big Finbar's place, the Walsh. Ha! <laughs> they were only blowins. He was a guard. Blowins like me? Ah, no, 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 no. You know what I, you know what I mean. Jeez, <laughs> you'll be losing business with them kind of remarks, huh? Valerie will agree with me there. Man. She knows what I mean. Valerie's very welcome. She knows that, don't you? Ah, leave her alone. You're embarrassing everybody now. Jesus, tell her the story. Ah, Janie, sure you have her in a haunted house already. She won't be able to sleep. No, I'd like to hear it. Ah, it's not even a real one. Ah, she wants to hear one. Don't be moaning and tell her. Come on. Ah, Janie. Just a bit. Headbangers is all it was. There was a house out near where we were, on the other side of the knock there. And it would have been the nearest house to us, Valerie, about a quarter mile down the road. And the old dad, Finnerty, lived on his own down there, and his family got him into a nursing home out by them down in Westport. And the people who moved in were the Walshes. And your man was a sergeant in the guard stationed in Carrick. And, like, he was 50-odd and still only a sergeant, so, like, he was no Sherlock Holmes, you know? <laughs> he was no Welsh of the yard or anything like that. <laughs> and they moved in. He had three daughters who were teenagers and a young fellow who was married back in Longford there. So the daughters lived with him and the missus. And I knew them a little bit because that was the year Big Finn Byer died. God rest him. And they arrived around the time of the funeral. So, you know, I met them then. And I was living on my own because me and Big Finn Byer were the only two in it at the time. So I was the bachelor boy with a gaggle of young ones after moving in next door, you know. Ha <laughs> ha, you hoo you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, around that time, I would have been wondering what to do, do you know, whether to sell it on or to farm it or, you know, I was 22, 23, you know. And uh, it was, it would have been around 11 or 12 o'clock this night and there was a knock at the door and it was Mrs. Walsh. And she was all upset and asking me if I could come in. She didn't know what to do. The husband was at work out on a call and she didn't know anyone in the area and there was a bit of trouble. So, what kind of trouble, I says. And she says she was after getting a phone call from the young one, Neve, and she was after doing the Luigi board. Or, or what you call it? Luigi board. The Ouija board. <laughs> the Ouija board. <laughs> she was down there in the chipper and carrick, was she, Finbar? Ah, fuck off, I meant the Ouija board. You know what I meant? And she was after being the Luigi boy. Yeah, come on now. She she was after being down in a friend of her's house with this, and they were after doing the Ouija board. 
And she phoned her mother to come and collect her. They said they were after getting a spirit for this. And she was scared, saying it was after her. Now, I obviously just thought it was a load of bollocks, you know, if you'll excuse the language. But here was the mother saying she'd gone and picked her up, and like, I mean, sorry, but I thought it was all a bit mad. But on the way back, they'd seen something. Like the mother had seen it as well, like a dog on the road, running with the car and running after it. Like there's dogs all around the place, you know, like the farmers had them. There was a big dog up there, Jack, that William McDermott had that time. Oh, Jesus, yeah. Uh, it was like a, if you saw it from a distance, you'd think it was a little horse. <laughs> oh, Saxon? That was it, Saxon! No, it was an Irish wolfhound. He got it from a farm <laughs> dog. That was huge! Now, you'd be used to seeing dogs all around the place, all kinds, but they'd be tame like their bark would be worse than their bite, so I wasn't too taken with the story. But. She wanted me to come down to the house because when they got back to the house, the young one, Neve, was going hysterical, saying there was something on the stairs, like no one else could see it, but she could. And it was a woman looking at her. And Mrs. Walsh didn't know what to do. They couldn't contact the hubby, and would I come down? I mean, what made her think there was anything I could do? I don't know, but she was panicking, like, you know? So I got in the car, and we went down, and Jesus, now, I've never seen the like of it. The young one was in bits. They had a blanket around her. and She was as white now. As white as that? Well, whiter, because that's probably filthy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm not messing now. And she wouldn't come out of the living room because she said there was a woman on the stairs. And I said, What's the woman doing? And she said, she's just looking at me. She was terrified. And I didn't know whether she was after taking drugs or drink or what she was after doing. So I says to phone Dr. Joe in Carrick. This is Joe Dillendaler. You'd see him in the town. He still has a surgery there beside the spar. Very nice fella. And I got through to him, and he was on his way, and the Neve one was shouting at me to close the living room door like she was that bad now. She could see the woman on the stairs. So Mrs. Walsh phoned Father Donald, told, uh, and he came down and uh, he sort of blessed the place a little bit. Like, he'd be more Vatican too. There wouldn't be much of all the demons or that kind to carry on with him, you know? <laughs> Jesus, sure. He'd collapse. He's like this, him and a demon. <laughs> <laughs> but Dr. Joe gave her a sedative, and off she went then, you know. And we all had a little drink, and poor Mrs. Walsh was understandably very shaken, you know. But Father Donald told her not to mind Luigi, and it was only an old cot, and it was Neve's imagination and all this. But then the phone rang, right? And it was the young fella, the brother who was married back in Longford, and he was all, that his baby was crying, and he had it out of the cot, and they were standing by the window, and there's all this commotion next door, cars in the drive and all. That then an old one who lived next door, who used to mind Neve and the other sisters when they were young and all this, who was bedridden, had been found dead at the bottom of the stairs. She'd fallen down, and they found her. And all right, whatever. Coincidence. But uh, that night at home, sitting at the fire, having the last bag before the sack, and Jack would know the house. The stairs come down into the main room, and I had my back to it, to the stairs. And it's stupid now, but the time. I couldn't turn around. I couldn't get up to go to bed because I thought there was something on the stairs. And he just sat there looking at an empty fireplace. And I sat there till it got bright. I was like a boy, you know. 
I wouldn't move in case something saw me. You know that way? I wouldn't even light another fag like I was dying for one. I wouldn't. Mad. But when it was bright then, I was grand, you know? <sighs> Obviously, there was nothing there and everything. And that was the last fag I ever had. <laughs> They moved away, though, then, after that, the Walshes. Yep. And that was when you moved down to Carrick? Yeah. Maybe that had something to do with it. I, I, I don't know. Hmm. Moving down into the lights, yeah? Hmm. <laughs> Might be, all right. Might be. Didn't want the loneliness, maybe, you know? Ah, he's all thinking about Lura now, huh? I think the header says you, huh? I think I'm going to powder me nose. Sure, we knew you were a headbanger, knew that all along. <laughs> yeah. I'd imagine, though, it can get very quiet. Oh, it can, yeah. Uh, you get used to it, Brendan. Yeah, you don't think about it. Me and Brendan are the fellows on our own. Jimmy has the mammy to look after, but we're, you know, you can come in here in the evening. During the day, you'd be working. Uh, you know, there's company all around. Bit of a community all spread around the place, like. You can turn the radio on. Have you got any plans or that for here? Not really, just trying to find some. Peace and quiet. Jeez, hmm. uh, you're in the right place, so, huh? You're going to have a peace and quiet overload. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure, you can always stick your head in here, and Jack or me or whoever will sort you out. I should be okay, thanks. You're only ten minutes up the road. And Jesus, from the looks of things, you'll have a job keeping Finbar away, huh? <laughs> uh, he's a dose. Jeez, I've never heard him called that before. Lots of other things, never <laughs> that. <laughs> what have you fecking heard? What you talking about this time, Mullen, huh? About how 20 Germans were poisoned by the drink in here last summer? No, oh, I'd say the arms is the place where that kind of carry-on <laughs> happens. You get a pint in there now, I believe, that it puts you on your back for a fortnight. Ah, don't mind them. They're only jealous, Valerie. Well, that's probably what it is, all right. Ah, you see now, at least there's one person on my side, huh? Yeah, right. She's only sticking up for you to make sure she gets a lift after you're scaring the living daylights out of her with your insistence on spooky stories. Go on. Sure, it's only headers like me get a friend like that, huh? Fucking <laughs> Lula's. Uh, uh, does anybody... Ah, uh, oh, no, I... Jim, I'm grand. You look after yourself. Uh, are you sure, uh, Valerie? I'll get you one. Ah, no. no. No, you're all right. You're the guest. You're the guest. Uh, can I get you a small one, Finbar? Ah, no. Thanks very much, Jim. I'm fine for the moment. Finish this pint. Small one, Jim. Yes, sir. Thanks, uh, Brendan. Uh, I'll just, uh, I'll just lash a bit of turf on that for that. Good man, Jim. Keep the chill out, huh? This is it. Oh, do you want to? Ah, no, no, no. Just watching the time. We've uh, we bought up wedding tomorrow. Would you be directly working in the hotel? Well, Saves them paying someone's wage. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Sure, that's how I have it, boy. We know. Uh, no, there's certain things I like to do myself on a big day. Uh, one of the first things I learned in the business was the importance of good stock. Soup stock. Uh, for the soup, for the gravy, for the sauces. Uh, you use it all over the place. It's just a little thing I do, a little ritual in the morning. I help do the stock. Uh, what do we have from yesterday and so on? It's just a little thing I do, a little mad thing, but there you are. I think that's lovely. Uh, it's a little thing I do, a little superstition. These will tell you. I'm famous for it. It's a gimmick. Uh, who's getting married, Mr. Bar? Do you know Nula Donnelly? Nula, they call her. She used to work for me in the arms. Ah, uh, yeah. Declan Donnelly's girl, gas young one. Oh, yeah. You used to be pals with Declan Jim. Oh, yeah. Poor Declan be dead ten years now in July. Lovely fellow. God rest him. Yeah. She's a gas young one, the daughter. Mm. New, they call her. Call me new, she says, the first day she worked for me. Ah, I'm not afraid to speak for, up for herself or anything. Used to tell us who was having affairs and all this. She knew all the couples that were being all illicit because she'd go in to do the room in the morning and the bed would be already made. The woman in the affair would have done it out of guilt, you see. Cover it all up for herself as much as for anyone else. She's a mad young one. 
<laughs> Would you get many people using the hotel? Ah, like that? Not at all. I wouldn't say so. No, but uh, ja uh, Nula, you know, uh, she's a gapper and a talker. <laughs> oh, who's she getting married to, Pendar? Ah, oh, Jesus, some fella from out the country. Must be in his forties. Shame, young one getting hitched to an old fella like that, huh? Ah, must have plenty of money. Be like getting married to that. He's a nice stash in the way in that little garage, I'll tell you, huh? Hoping to track some little thing with it. Isn't that right, Jack? That's my plan. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. But you want to be careful of these old lads living on their own. They got a big pot of stew constantly on the heat. They keep dropping a few bits of scraps into it every couple of days, and they survive on that. Don't you, Jack? That'd do ya. It's a feast every day. <laughs> Ah, dreadful fellas, yeah. Then they managed to get a girl, and the dust would be like that on everything, and ah, the poor man would be living in two rooms all his life, and the young one would have to come in and clean it all out. Thirty years of old newspapers and cheap thrillers all lying there in the damp since their mammies died, and that would be the last cleaning that went on in the place. Is that right, Jack? That's us to a T. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. speak for yourself, huh? They'd be desperate men, changing the sheets in the bed every Christmas, and oh, soot all over everything, and bits of rasher, and pudding, and egg on the floor. The poor girl? Ah, poor girl is right. So the least I can do is make sure her reception in the arms is a little memory for her to have in the future, in the cold nights. Cheers. You have a terrible warped mind. Do you know that? Ah, you're only telling it how it is, huh? <laughs> Nula getting married. You don't feel the time. No. <laughs> I remember. Must have been uh, 20 or more years ago. Doing a job with him. Desmond. Talking about what you were saying earlier. The priest over in Glen was looking for a couple of local boys to do some work. He was down in Carrick in the arms, which was an odd thing. Anyway, like, what was he doing coming all the way over for a couple of local fellas? But Declan Donnelly got put on to him, and it was for uh, a few quid, and he called up to me, and we were to leave for the church in Glen the following morning. I remember I was dying with the flu, and I had a terrible high temperature. The mother wanted me to stay in the labor and burn it off, but it was for a few quid on the QT, so I told him, yeah, I do it tomorrow, no problem. <laughs> and the next day, it was lashing rain. Ooh, I'll never forget it. And he called for me in his dad's car. Oh, the smell of sheep in it like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> he used to put them in the car and chauffeur <laughs> them around, you know. <laughs> Then we, we drove over to Glen and we met the priest and the sacristy and the job of all things was to dig a grave in the yard. That day was the removal and they needed the grave for the following morning. And fair dues, like Declan said, was there no one else around the place that could have done it? And the priest got all cagey and said something about the local boys being involved with a game of gar or something. And it was it was pelting rain, so so he gave us the leggings and the wellies and whatever else they had around there and a couple of shovels. And then he put up his umbrella all annoyed like and he took us out and showed us the grave under a tree. It was a family one, and there were two in it already, the mother and the father, and this was to be for the boy. Well, not really a boy, more like a middle-aged fella. But since there were two down in it already, we weren't going to have to dig down for miles, like. <laughs> so the priest went off to get ready, and the me and Declan got stuck in. And with the rain and, and the flu, I, 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 I remember my, my legs got sore, and my arms got sore, and my neck got sore, and I was boiling. But we got down about two and a half foot, and and then decided to take a little break. So we got in Declan's car, and he pulled out a big bottle of pochin and a few sambos. Well, I couldn't eat anything, but I did take a good belt out of the bottle, which <laughs> got me into some sort of shape. <laughs> and then we just sat there, listening to the radio and the sound of the rain. And 
Then we got out and got stuck in again. Just had a little swig every half an hour or so just to keep it going. And we saw the hearse arrive then. And the mad thing was, there was only two or three other fellows there for the service. And for a man who was not an old man, it was funny, you know. And when that was done, the priest came out to us, we were almost done, and he gave us clearance for the funeral the following day. And then um, he went off to do his uh, business. So me and Declan were the only two there then. And your man was laid out in the church. And Declan went off to get a piece of tarp to stretch over the grave, and I just put a big lump of door on it. <laughs> and I just sat under the tree finishing the last few drops of the bottle, thinking we just might stick our head in a place for a few quick pints on the way back, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I saw this fella coming out of the church, walking straight towards me. He was dressed in a suit, so I reckon he was paying his respects or whatever. And over he comes through the gravestones, looking around him like he didn't know the place. And he stood right next to me under the tree, looking at the grave. And I didn't know what to say. And he goes, is this for so-and-so? And I couldn't remember the name. So I said, yeah, that, that's right. And he goes, it's the wrong grave. And I said, no, no, this is where the priest said, like. And then he just looked. Breathing hard through his nose like he was holding back his temper. And he says, Come on, I'll show you. And then he just walks off. And I was like, Fuck this, you know. <laughs> and I was cursing Declan for taking so long. <laughs> and then your man turns around and says, Come on. <laughs> and he was like a lula, you know, and I almost fell into the grave myself with tiredness and I was sick. So I followed him just to get it over with. And he, he stopped in front of a grave, like a new enough one, a white one, with a picture of a little girl on it. And he goes, it's this one here. And I'm like, uh, all right, right you are, mister. I'll have it done. No, no problem. See you now. <laughs> and then he just sort of touched the top of the gravestone and walked back into the church. Oh, I was breathing a sigh of relief when Declan came back with the tarp and I said, did you see your man there? He didn't know what I was saying. So I told him we just had a bit of a laugh about it and then we got out of there. And we stopped at the green man on the way back for a few pints. And that night, my fever broke, but I was knackered. The mother wouldn't let me go to the burial, so I figured Declan did it on his own. So I was laid up for a few days. And then one morning, the mother brought me in the paper. And there, on the obituaries, was a picture of the man whose grave he dug. And I think you know what I'm going to tell you. It was the spit of the man I met in the graveyard. Well, at first I just thought it was a, a brother or a relative, so I forgot all about it for ages. Until one night, Declan told me that he found out the reason why the priest from Glen was looking for some tarot tellers. It turns out that the man whose grave we dug had a bit of a reputation for being a pervert. And Jay's, when I heard that, and if it was him, and he wanted to go down into the grave with a little girl even after they were gone, it didn't bear thinking about. I forgot all about it until you started talking about Declan Donnelly's girl, yeah. Jesus, Jim, it's a terrible story to be telling. Well, you know, we've been drinking, 
had a few from Dick Lenahan's batch, you know. Oh, Jesus. Fire water. Sure, that'd put a hole in the glass, let alone give you hallucinations. Do you think it was a hallucination, Jim? I don't know. But I was flying like, and it was a right fluke him showing me exactly where he wanted to be buried and me knowing nothing about him like. Hmm. You all right, Valerie? <laughs> you look a bit peaky there. Uh, I'm, I'm fine. Um, actually, it's the ladies out this way. Oh, Jesus. Uh, I'll tell you what, Valerie, this is very embarrassing, but the ladies is busted. And with the... <laughs> I'm getting it fixed for the Germans, like, but I haven't got it yet. Ah, you're a terrible man, Brendan. No, oh, come on. I'll bring you in the house. Are you sure? Oh, yeah, yeah. No problem. Don't worry, Valerie. If you're not back in ten minutes, we'll come and get you, okay? Jesus, would you give it a rest? Come on, Valerie. I'll put the lights on for you. Out this way. Bye now. Bye. Yep. Yes. Some fucking story. You're telling the girl like perverts out in the country for fuck's sake. Like your story had nothing in it, huh? That was only old headers in it. But you brought the whole thing up with the fairies. The fairies she's in that house. Forgot it was that house. Forgot it was more kneeling to us an honest mistake. Honest mistake. What? Don't be giving it that old card now. What do you mean? With bringing her around and all. What about it? Bringing her up the head and all. Yeah? So don't be giving it the old card now. Oh, what card, Jack? I'm asking you. Oh, what? come on, have a small one. Come on, boys. Hang on a minute, Jim. What? Will you get me to tell a story about the house she's in? I didn't know that, though. I told you that. Whatever. Okay, I'm sorry. What? I regret the stories, then. I don't think we should have any more of them, but that's all. I, I wasn't thinking. I just said it. It came out when you were talking about Declan Donnelly. Well, I mean, we're not just... blaming anybody, Jim. I regret it now, and let's not have any more of them, and that's all. Oh, you regret it now? Yeah. <clears throat> it's not part of the tour. I oh, know. Come on. Bit of local color. No, Jack. Just don't berate Jim for telling a story after you telling one yourself. I apologize if that's what I did. Sorry, Jim. No, I'll say that, but stop with this tour guide thing. That's not fair. The woman moved out here on her own for some reason. There is something obviously going on in her life. I'm just trying to make it easier for her. Give her a welcome for fuck's sake, so don't be implying anything else. I don't like it. Now, I've apologized to Jim, and I'm saying no more stories. Sure, I'm married. I mean, really, you are the single boys. <laughs> sure, I can't remember the last time I saw a suit on you. <laughs> oh, now it's me. Oh, that's enough. That, 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 that is enough of that, boys. Come on. You think I have intentions, is it? I don't know. You're entitled. I do often wear a suit. Don't come in here for the first time in God knows thinking we're fucking hicks. Because you're from around here. Nobody's saying that. You've got the wrong idea, Jack, and it's not worth falling out over now. I'll buy you a drink, and that'll be the fucking end of it now, all right? You will not buy me a fucking drink. I'll buy you one, and that will be the end of it. <laughs> oh, that's better. That's much more like it, man. What do you say? No, it's all right. It, it, it's forgotten. Finbar. Ah. I think I'll have a glass, Jack. You'll have a small one with that. Ah! You'll fucking kill me now, huh? I think he's trying to kill me, Jim, is he? Oh, yeah. yeah no. Jim! Uh, a small one, please, Jack. You'll have a little pint with that. Thank <laughs> oh. Good man. Woo! <laughs> Jeez. That was a hot one there for a minute, huh? We'll say no more about it. We might tell a few jokes when she comes. <laughs> Jace, this is it. How's the mammy, Jim? Ah, you know what it is? She's just old and everything's going on her. Ah, Jesus, huh? I have to get up and see her. I was saying that earlier. 
It'd be the time, you think, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> she does feel right on her own with coming out for an old jar, that. <laughs> oh, don't mind her. She's well able to tell you what's what. The only thing would be the eyes. She's the one. I'm the one that's always mixing up the tablets, but she'll tell you exactly what she's supposed to take when. <laughs> well, that's all right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm taking her up to uh, see her sister in the order. That's a closed order, Jim, yeah? Yeah, they don't uh, talk there at all. <laughs> and the sister is six years older than Mammy, so... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Guess! <laughs> she'd be all right for the drive? Oh, she'll be knackered. She'll be out like a light when we get home. Ah. Ah, oh, yeah. So this is the original, uh, before the house. Right. Uh, there you are. We thought we were going to have to send out a search party. I was having a good nosy around. Oh, wasn't too much of a state, no? Tidier than I normally am. Oof. That's he had the sisters over today. That's all that is. Ah, <laughs> saw them having their lunch in my place today. Ah, don't be talking. Oh, <laughs> back off their sensitive area. <laughs> Uh, Valerie, darling, I don't want you to be stranded here with me now if I'm keeping you. Sure, we can look after it. Oh, grand for a while yet, yeah. no? I am hearing about all these stories, you know. It's ah, it's the end of them now. We've had enough of them old stories. They're a rolling old cod. We were just joking about it there when you were out. Uh, well, I'll be, I'll be witness. We won't be able to sleep in our own beds. Um, no, uh, you see, something happened to me that... Just hearing you talk about tonight, it's important to me that I'm not, well, bananas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fairly straight, down the line sort of person working. I had a good job at DCU. I went back to work after having my daughter, me. I went back to, well, my husband teaches engineering at DCU and we'd leave in 1988. I went back to work when she was five, when she started school. And we'd leave her with Daniel's parents, my husband's parents. His mother would pick her up from school and I'd collect her after work. And, and last year, she was dying to learn how to swim. And the school, they, they had a thing. They'd take the class down to the CRC in Clontarf on Wednesdays. She was learning very well, <laughs> loved the water, no problem. She couldn't wait for Wednesdays and swimming. And Daniel used to take her down to the pool on Saturdays and everything. But for such a bright, outgoing, happy girl, she was a big, um, well, she had a problem sleeping at night. She was afraid of the dark. She never wanted you to leave the room. But one of us would have to go in and lie with her until she went off, and even when we did, she'd often have to come in and lie with us. And I'd say to her, what's wrong when you go to bed? But in the daytime, you know, she wouldn't care. Nighttime was a million miles away. But at night, there were people at the window, people in the attic, someone coming up the stairs. There were children knocking in the walls, and, and there was always a man across the road who she'd see. Like, there were loads of things the poor, well, I wanted to take her to a doctor, but Daniel said she'd grow out of it, and we should just be careful about the books we got her and what she saw on the telly and all this, but. I mean, she even used to be scared that when she got up in the morning that Mammy and Daddy would have been gone and she'd be in the house all on her own. That was when she told Daniel's mother. And all the furniture and the carpets and everything would be gone. I, I mean, you know. So I told her, you know, we'd never. It was ridiculous. And if she was ever worried during the day to ring me and I'd come and collect her. And she knew our number. She was... Very good at learning off the numbers and everything. She knew ours and her nana's and mine at work. She, she knew them all. But then in March of last year, the school had a, a sponsored swim and the kids were just gonna swim the length of the pool. I promised I'd be there, but I got, um, I was late out of work and I was only gonna be there in time to meet her afterwards. But when I got in, there was an ambulance. And I thought like, well, the pool is in the central remedial clinic. So I thought, you know, someone was just being dropped there. I wasn't really paying any attention.
But when I got in, I saw that there was no one in the pool. And the teacher was there with a group of kids. And she was crying, and, and some of the children were crying. And this woman, one of the other moms, came over. She said there'd been an accident. And Neve had hit her head in the pool. And she'd been in the water, and they'd been trying to resuscitate her. But she said it was going to be all right. And I didn't believe it was happening. I, I thought it must have been someone else. I, I went into, well, I was brought into a room, and, and Neve was on a table. It was a table for table tennis, and, and the ambulance man was, was giving her the, the kiss of life. She was in her bathing suit. And the ambulance man said he didn't think what he was doing was working. And he wasn't sure if she was alive. And he wrapped her up in a towel and, and carried her out to the ambulance. And, and I got in the back with him. And they radioed on ahead that they were going to put her on a machine in Beaumont and try to revive her there. But the ambulance man knew, I think. She wasn't breathing. And he said, if I wanted to say goodbye to her in the ambulance, in case I didn't get a chance to at the hospital. And I gave her a little hug. And she was freezing cold. And I told her Mammy loved her very much. She just looked asleep, but, but her lips were, were gone blue. And, and she was dead. And it happened so fast, just, just a few minutes. And I don't think I have to tell you how, how hard it was between me and Daniel as well. It didn't seem real. At the funeral, I just thought I could go and lift her out of the coffin. And it would be the end of all this. I think Daniel was, well, I don't know if he actually blamed me. There was nothing I could do, but he became very busy in his work, just, just keeping himself, you know. But I was, I was more. I just didn't really know what I was doing. Just walking around, wanting to, sitting with, with Daniel's mother, just, just fussing around the place. Just months of this. I'm not really talking about it like. But then one morning, I was in bed. Daniel had gone to work. I usually lie there for a few hours just trying to stay asleep, I suppose. And the phone rang. And I just left it. I wasn't going to get it. And it rang for a long time. And eventually it, it stopped and I was dropping off again. But it started ringing again for a long time. So I thought it, it must have been Daniel trying to get me or, or someone who knew I was there. So I went down and I answered it. The line was, was very faint. It was like a cross line. There were voices, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. And then I heard Neve. And she just said, Mammy? And I just said, y you know, yes. And she said she wanted me to come and collect her. And I wasn't sure whether this was a dream or her leaving us had been a dream, but I just said, where are you? And she said she thought she was at Nana's in the bedroom. But Nana wasn't there. And she was scared. There were children knocking in the walls. And the man was standing across the road. And he was going to cross the road. And would I come and get her? And I said I would. Of course I would. And I dropped the phone and I ran out to the car and just the t-shirt I'd slept in. And I drove to Daniel's mother's house. I could hardly see. I was crying so much. I mean, I knew she wasn't going to be there. I knew she was gone. But to think that wherever she was, that, and, and there was nothing I could do about it. 
Daniel's mother got a doctor and I slept for a day or two, but it was, well, Daniel felt that I needed to face up to me being gone. But I just felt that he needed to face up to what happened to me. He was insisting I get some treatment and everything would be okay. But you know, if I can help that, she's still out there. She still, she still needs me. I heard her. Sure, you were after getting a terrible shock, Valerie. These things can happen. Your brain is trying to deal with it, you know? Is your husband going to come down? I don't think so. Oh, it'd be a terrible shame if you don't. You didn't see him because of something as. You know, that, that you don't even know what it was. She said she knew what it was. But sure you can't just accept that, that, you know, I mean, surely you, you have to look at the broader thing of it here. Maybe it was the wrong number. What? No, maybe it was the wrong number or something wrong with the phone and you think you heard something, but But you were... wouldn't hear someone's voice on the fucking thing, Jim. I'm just saying it might have been something else, such yeah, as... Go easy, Brendan. Jim's only trying to talk about the fucking thing. Lads! Just take it easy! Hey, stop! Just something that happened. It's just nice to be here and hear what you were saying. To know I'm not crazy. Very love, nobody's going to think that. I mean, just, but, you know, no one knows about these things, sure, they're not real even. You hear all sorts of old cod all around, but there's usually some kind of explanation for it. Sure, Jim said himself he was delirious with the flu that time, Jim. Yeah, I had a right temperature. More uh, uh, kneeling? Sure, she was in here every night of the week, Brendan, about how much would she drink? Be honest now. How much would she drink? Have a bit of respect, Finbar. Oh, I'm just trying to make a point, Jack. The woman was a drinker. We're all drinkers. But, come on now. She was an alcoholic, Valerie. She used to have a bottle of whiskey put away before you knew where you were. Sure, who wouldn't be hearing knocking after that? Ah, oh, you're not being fair on her now. That woman's dead. She can't defend herself. I'm not casting anything on her. If she came through that door right now, if she were alive, I'd be buying her a drink. More power to her. I'd hope she'd enjoy it. But I run a bar myself down in the arms, and I know all about what a right tooth drinks will do to you. She liked her drop, is what I'm saying. And what about you and the Walshes? Look, how many times do I have to say it? They're all a bunch of fucking headbangers. I got the wind put on me that night, fair enough, but that's what these stories do. But I resent that now, what I went through that night. But I was only young and it was all over with. Fucking headbangers. And after all that, I'm ignoring the bigger thing. I'm very sorry if I should talk to her, Valerie. I, I'm very sorry indeed. Oh, we all are. Of course we are. It's, it's terrible. I'm going to have to go now, I'm afraid. I don't want to, but... Okay. Here, we'll leave her down. No, but she might want to come on now, no? Uh, um... Uh, relax for a little while longer. Have another drink. I think I am going to hang on for another little while. You're going to go easy on the old stories. Ah, stop being an old woman. She'll be grand. All right? She'll be grand. Mm. Oh, could I get a lift, Timber? Of course you can, Jim. You okay for Father Donald's car in the morning? Uh, sure, a uh, quarter to nine. Grand. Just, I have to get out to Connor Bowl. Well, that's fine. Uh, Brendan? Nagy? Yeah. Well, Valerie. It was very nice to meet you. Yes, I, I am. Um, I'm terribly sorry about what happened to you. And I'm sure your little girl is safe and comfortable wherever she is. She's an innocent, a little saint, 
And I'm going to say a little prayer for her. Not that she needs it. And that man I saw in the graveyard that time, it was just the rotten pusheen and the fever I had. Then Bar's right. You enjoy your peace and quiet, and we'll see you around. You're very nice. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Jim. Sorry. Valerie. Thanks for everything. Oh, my pleasure, darling. And I'll call up to you now in the next day or two. And Fine. We'll make sure you're all right and that you're settling in with us. You're very welcome. Thanks for everything, Finbar. Oh, it's quite all right. Men! Finbar. I'll see you soon, I hope, Jack. All right. See you soon. <laughs> Brendan! Take it easy now, Finbar. Take care of yourself. Don't leave it so long next time. Okay. <laughs> Good night. Good night, Jim. See you soon. See you in the morning. Quarter to nine. See you now. And there you are now. I'm sorry for snapping that time. Ah, sure, I was. I think it was my fault. What'd you go on? Of course it wasn't your fault. But, you know, it's all very well us sitting around fecking with these old stories. Uh, but then, for something personal like that, that's happened to you, people are going to deal with it in different ways. Jim was, you know. Yeah. He didn't mean anything. Yeah, he didn't really mean there was anything wrong uh, with your phone, uh, I don't think. <laughs> it's um, a, a terrible thing that happened. Uh, do you ever get over something like that, I wonder? I don't mean the phone call, you know. I know. Uh, I don't know. We're very sorry. all the same when the mammy goes. What do you think? Oh, definitely. She's been very sick, Valerie, for years now. Fading fast, like, for years. <laughs> <laughs> Still spoils the boy rotten, though, huh? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. That's an awful lot. Eh, not really. There's no law says you have to drink it all. Your man does put it back in the bottle. <laughs> Would you ever fuck off? <laughs> I think we should drink this to you, sweetheart. Yes, to Valerie. Hope it's all in the end. Uh, cheers. Uh, cheers. There's the boy, huh? <laughs> You've no children, Jack, no? No, darling, never married. Uh, but I do be telling this fellow to be on the lookout, a young fellow like him, not to end up like me. Do you wish you had married? Sure, who'd have me? A cantankerous old fucker like me. <laughs> <laughs> Too right. <laughs> yeah, it's a thing, you know. I do say it to Brendan. I'm down in the, in the garage and the fucking tin roof on the thing. <laughs> All alone on that country road. You see, it was bypassed by the main road and the carriage, and there's no... Like in the summer, the heat has the place like an oven with the roof. Or if it's not that, it's the rain pelting down on it like bricks. The noise of it. And there you'll be. The only car stopping in be someone that knows the area real well. Ah, uh, you definitely feel it like. But you know, I get down here for a pint and that. And there's a lot to be said for the company and the, uh, you know, the someone there. Oh, yeah. Did you never consider it when you were young? Oh, sure, yeah. Of course I did. Sure, what the hell else does a young fellow be thinking about, you know? <laughs> and Brandon knows. I had a girl. A lovely girl back then. We were courting for three years. Um, uh, 1963 to 66. But she wanted to go up to Dublin, you know. She would have thought that's what we should have done. And I don't know why it was a thing with me, that I, 
an irrational fear, I suppose, that kept me here. And I couldn't understand why she wanted to be running off up to Dublin, you know. <laughs> and she did, in the end. Anyway, like, and she was working there, waiting for me to come. But with me, he was a mad thing. That I thought it was a thousand fucking miles away. <laughs> Hated going up. I went up a few times, like, but I was going up for, you know, she had a room. <laughs> Freezing damn place. I was a terrible fella. It became that that was the only reason I was going for. I couldn't stand being away. I, I don't know why. Ah, uh, I'd be all excited about going up for the physical, uh, <laughs> the freedom of it. <laughs> but after a day and a night, and I'd had my fill, we'd be going for a walk, and I'd be all catty and bored and moochy. Breaking the poor girl's heart. Ah, uh, you get older and look back on why you did things, you see a lot of the time there wasn't a reason. You do a lot of things out of pure cussedness. I stopped answering her letters, and I'd fucking dread one coming to the house, and her in it, wondering how I was, and was there something wrong with the post or this? I can't explain what carry-on I was up to. I had just left her out. Being the big fella, me dad handing over the business to me, be swanning around, a man of substance. And then I had the gall to feel resentful when she wrote and said she was getting married to a fella. And I was all, that it was her fault for going up in the first place. <laughs> there was a delegation of people from all around here going up to the wedding on the bus, and I was just one of the crowd, just one of the guests in my suit, and the shoes nearly polished off me. <laughs> and a hangover like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I'd been up to five or more, swilling the stuff, looking at the fire. And we were all on the bus at nine. And all the chat all around was why she hadn't come home to get married. And me, sick as a dog. The smell a brill cream <laughs> off all us culties. <laughs> Sitting in the church in Fidsborough. All her lovely looking nurse friends and their guard boyfriends. She was marrying a guard. Huge fella. Shoulders like a big gorilla. And they were coming down the aisle after. And I gave her the cheesiest little grin you've ever seen. A little grin that was saying, enjoy your big gorilla, because the future is all ahead of me. And she just looked at me like I was only another guest at the wedding. And that was that. And the future was all ahead of me. Years and years of it. I could feel it coming. All those things you've got to face on your own, all by yourself. And you bear it because you're showing everybody what a great fellow you are all together. But I left the church like a little boy, and I walked away. I couldn't go to the reception. I just kept walking. There was a light rain. I just kept walking. And then I was in town. It was a dark day, like there was a roof on the sea. And I found myself in a little labyrinth of streets with nothing doing. And I ducked into a pub, little dark place, only one or two others there. A business like barman, like yourself, Brenton. Business like, dutiful thing. And I put a pint or two away, and a small one or two. And I sat there, just looking down at the dirty wooden bar. And the barman asked, if I was all right? Simple little question. And I said I was. And he said he'd make me a sandwich. And I said, OK. And I nearly started crying, because you know, here was someone just. And 
I want. He took two big slices off a fresh loaf and buttered them carefully, spreading it all around. I'll never forget. And then he sliced some cheese and cooked ham and an onion out of the jar and put it all on a plate and sliced it down the middle. And just someone doing this for me and putting it down in front of me. Get that down, you know, he said. <laughs> and then he folded up his newspaper and went off on his break. And there was another bar. And I took this sandwich up. And I could hardly swallow it because of the lump in my throat. But I ate it all down because someone I didn't know had done this for me. Such a small thing, but a huge thing in my condition. It fortified me like no meal I've ever had in my life. And I went to that reception. And I was properly ashamed of myself. There was a humility that I've tried to find since. But goodness wears off. And it just gets easier to be a contrary bollocks. Down in the garage. Spinning small jobs out all day. Taking hours to fix a puncture. Stops you thinking about what might have been and what you should have done. It's like looking away, like I did at that reception. You should only catch someone's eye for the right answer. And I'll tell you, there's not one morning that I don't wake up with her name in the room. I do be at this fella, don't I? <laughs> yep. I may be on my way now. <laughs> Will you be okay that way? Jace, I should be used to that road by now, says you. Huh? I'll get you the torch. Am I a boner? Nah, there's well fucking worse, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, that wasn't a ghostly story anyway, at least, huh? No. We've had enough of them, huh? <laughs> we'll all be ghosts soon enough, says you, huh? Mm. We'll all be sitting here, sipping whiskey all night <laughs> with Maura Neal. This has been a strange little evening for me. For me as well. Fuck, we could do worse. It was lovely to meet you. You too. I didn't mean to go on there. No, please. Not something about your company. Inspiring, huh? <laughs> and this, of course. <laughs> I wonder if being out here in the country is the best place for you to, you know. Why? Ah, a girl like you, hiding yourself away, listening to old headers like us talking about the fairies, <laughs> having all your worst fears confirmed for you. Tuh. Ghosts and angels and all this. Fuck them. I won't have it. Because I won't see someone like you upset by it. You have enough to deal with for fuck's sake. I am very sorry, love, about what happened. Thanks. Uh, batteries are weak. Come on, I'll drop you. Are you sure? Sure, I'm giving battery lift. Come with us. Okay, Grand. Do you need a hand, Brendan? Oh, no. Stay where you are. I'll be finished in a sec. Is this yours, Valerie? Yeah, right? <laughs> Come on. Oh, now, very nice. Uh, these are the touches, huh, Brendan? That's them. Now. Thanks. Up early in the morning, over to Connor Bolin. He's over the other side of Carrick there. Has about 15 fucking kids, dirty bollocks. <laughs> and you should see her, built like a fucking tractor, the head on her. <laughs> You're a terrible man. I've had my moments. Will you be in here again soon? Ah, I'm always in and out. Got to keep the place afloat, at least, you know. 
Don't mind him now, Mallory. He and the Jimmy fellow will be fierce scarce around her next few weeks. Why? Now the Germans will be coming in. They love it in here. You don't like that? Ah, uh, he thinks they're too noisy. <laughs> See, you don't know what they do be saying or anything. <laughs> him and the Jimmy fella be sitting at the bar with big old sour pusses on their face, uh, putting out like a couple of old grannies. <laughs> We're not that bad. They're like a pair of bloody old ones. You should see them. <laughs> Where do you go instead? Uh, place down in Carrick, the pot. The pot. There do be just as many of them down there now. Don't be caught on yourself. Oh, no. It doesn't seem as bad down there now. <laughs> That's because this is your place. Now, you've hit it on the head. See, Brendan, Valerie's defended us. It's out of respect for this place. Is it my fucking Barney respect the two of you is leaving me behind the bar with my arms folded, picking me whole, not knowing what the hell's going on? And them playing all them old 60s songs on the guitars, and they don't even know the words. And there's nothing left for me to do but pull a few pints and watch as the shadow of the knock moves across the floor with the sun going down. I'm like some fucking mender. I do be watching it, watching it creeping up on the Germans. And they don't even notice it. Oh, I must be cracking up if that's my entertainment of an evening. Ah, don't be moaning. I'll tell you what. If Valerie's willing to come in and brave the Germans, I'm sure me and Jimmy will come in and keep you company. How's that now? Oh, you'll grace us with your ugly mushes now. Don't push it, boy. <laughs> ah, sure, Jesus, what am I talking about? Sure, you'll have Finbar in here sniffing around Valerie every night anyway. <laughs> oh, no, stop. He'll be like a fly in a big pile of shite, so he will. <laughs> Jesus, that came out all wrong, didn't it? <laughs> oh, Jack, that was perfect as usual. <laughs> Couldn't have come out worse. Sorry about it. Would you relax? Sorry. Will you anyway? What? Come in with the Germans? Yeah. Doesn't bother me. Ah, I think that's the right idea. You should stay with the company and the bright one. Uh, do you see my keys? Sure, I might even learn some German. Uh, I don't know. Uh, they're, uh, are they from Germany, Brendan? What? The Germans. We call them the Germans. Is this them? Yeah, thanks. All right. Where are they? Is it Denmark or Norway? It's somewhere like that. Ah. I don't know where the fuck they're from. 